Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast, and this is our Halloween episode. Basically, we are going to give different topics that we've talked about in the past, as well as Amanda and I are going to discuss Halloween kills. So, without further ado, let's get on with the show. <laughs> my name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today is my co-host, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. Hey, hey. Troy and John are off this week, so it's just a man and I, but you will hear John in one of the later segments. You're also going to hear Brian Williams, former host, Justin McCumber, former host, Scott Clark, former host. They're going to be in one of the segments for this Halloween episode. And we're also going to have Tony Moran, who was a actual Michael Myers. You're going to hear little snippets from our yeah. interview with him a year ago. So, woo, it's going to be a fun episode. I hope you have some interesting Spooky. stuff to listen to. <laughs> Yes. Spooky. You know, like I said, this is a Halloween episode, so everything here is basically Halloween themed. And we're going to start with a discussion Amanda and I had on movies that force us to face our own fears. So I'm going to lead with that. And then we're going to be right back with Halloween Kills. And before we get to Halloween Kills, Tony Moran, who's also going to tell us about his stint as Michael Myers. That's right. Not the shape. Michael Myers. Very important distinction, just so you know. And then later, we're going to listen to a discussion on our horror movie survival guide, the two do's and the two don'ts to survive a horror film. And then, of course, we're going to get into psychological horror versus gore. Why do we like both or either or neither or neither? I like neither. That's a lie. No, 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 I'm saying I like the word neither. You were going between neither oh, and neither. Okay. I like neither. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. We got that settled. She likes neither. Let's get into when movies force us to face our own fears. When entertainment makes you face your fears, that is our From the Outside In topic this week. We're going to talk about when we get terrified by stuff. Yeah, I don't like it. Well, we're, we're all definitely afraid of something. So if whatever you are terrified of appears on screen, can you finish through it or do you have to turn away? It depends on what it is. There are certain things that are like like spiders or bugs. I close my eyes. I cover my eyes. So you, do, you don't go seek out movies that are about bugs? Hell no. A hard pass. There's there's a very slim chance that if I see that this is like it, ha it revolves around bugs or if it's a horror movie where there's a lot of spiders and bugs, I'm not going to watch it. If I do, I'm covering my eyes during those scenes. And this is like not to be a child, but like I will I have this intense fear of them that like I've had nightmares for a very long time since I was in like fifth grade. And so I'll Someone have told you there's a spider them. right above your head. Don't you. fucking say that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Works. <laughs> not funny. Okay. Not funny. Um, I'm laughing on the inside. But there's other things that like just petrify me because and and it shakes me to my core and I can try to sit through them. But then those also like that's just more of a discomfort. Like what's an example of that? Any like a s rape or assault scenes. Mm. Those are really, really hard for me to sit through. But like any horror where it's just gore and somebody's getting chopped up or bloods everywhere. Like none of that bothers me. And of course, that like scares me if it were happening to me. But I'm able to separate that this is all just make believe on screen. But for whatever reason, when it comes to things that like really emotionally I I connect with or terrify me, I'm it makes me uncomfortable to my core. So I just have to really try to either turn my eyes, cover my eyes, or really sit through it. And sometimes it's hard. I really like when movies tap into something I'm terrified of because if they do it right, it's usually I mean it's hard to scare me. I've seen so many movies. I mean it's fascinating mm -hmm. when they get it right. And if they if they nail it, it's terrifying. And I get into it. I'm like, yeah, that scared the shit out of me. There's when, um, you know, I have some. I'm petrified of bees. That's one thing I'm petrified. Just absolutely petrified. Very rarely do I see a good bee movie, though. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I see I've seen good bee movies, but I've never seen a really good bee bzz movie. movie. Yeah, bzz movie. <laughs> so there, there's that's never really been something that's gotten to me except one case, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but needles in fingertips. Mm, like where they go on t between the skin and the fingernail. If, if there's certain movies where you, you see that they're torturing people yeah. or something like that. 
Anything where you rip a fingernail off or you stick a needle in the the tips of somebody's fingers, anything like that, that gets me. I don't know why that bothers me so much. Maybe I was, my mom used to pull my nails off. I have no idea. (laughs) But that is something that just freaks me out. Legitimately creeps me out, freaks me out. And I have a hard time watching it. If it happens, like Saw movies, that stuff happens every now and again. Those are the scenes I can't watch. I can watch you literally peel flesh off somebody's face. Mm -hmm. But if you peel a fingernail off, I can't watch that. And I don't know why. I also, so I really don't, I'm scared of ghosts. And it's because like I lost. fake things. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. I lost a, a, somebody was very important to me when I was younger. And I always had this like really weird, very weird, irrational fear that they would always be able to like watch me like a ghost. So I was scared sometimes to take showers alone if it was like dark outside or something because then I was now like, you got to worry about cameras. <laughs> I know there's all of these things, um, but that was one of the things that started to scare me as I got older into my adulthood. I wasn't too terrified as a child to watch any ghost things, but now they get me. But I'll still watch them. I can sit through it and I don't like turn my eyes away. But I like grip on. I'm like, oh, it's gonna come. It's gonna happen. It's gonna get me. It's gonna get me. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. It takes a lot for it to actually do you get haunted like do you go home and you have nightmares and stuff um that happened one time in particular i remember where just like it messed my whole life up and that was when i saw paranormal activity i went home and i couldn't even pee with the door shut i like had it open and i there was just no way i was closing the door but if there if you pee with the door open and the ghost pulls you it's gonna yank you out of the toilet then you're gonna have like pee all over (laughs) But I'd rather be able to get out of that room than be isolated in that one containment with no windows. Okay, let me let me explain this part to you. So, <laughs> if if there were, I'm like looking over my shoulder now. <laughs> hang on, if there were such a thing as a ghost, which doesn't exist, I don't like talking about it. Even well, don't worry, it's not real, so it's not even. <laughs> if there were such a thing as ghosts in real, your door is not going to make any difference. I know. Guess what? <laughs> they go right through it. <laughs> It's not like they get to the door and they're like, God damn it. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> she locked the door. Would well, you open it? Come on. Sometimes that happens in ghost movies, though, like where the door the door will just be shaking and shaking. And it makes and no shaking. sense. They're ghosts. <laughs> they literally float all over. It's like, they, apparently they can't get through wood. Like, that makes no sense. What is a barrier? Oh, it drives me crazy when I see that happen in movies. Because you'll always see them float from floor to floor. But they get to a door and they're like, burr, 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 shaking the door. Burr, 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 it's probably just to scare door. you. Yeah, I get that, but it's a dumb plot. But mechanic. I also I feel like when they're they ghosts, shut, <laughs> but they can shut the door also, and that scares me. Where they can shut you and lock you into a room. In this bathroom, there's no windows. It's an interior room. It's not an exterior room. If I try to punch through the drywall, guess what? I'm still inside the house. Guess what? If their ghosts are real, they're still there too, <laughs> and they're gonna be in whatever room. They're literally just hanging out in the bathtub, chilling, smoking a ghost cigarette, waiting for you to freak out because they're like. Like, you know I'm in here, right? Like you can't keep me out. I'm a ghost. Man, I'm starting to get like really freaked out. This I can't tell weird. if it's like spiders or ghosts that are freaking. Like I sometimes I feel like I have spiders crawling on me if I think. So do about you really them too believe much. in them? Ghosts? Like, legitimately believe in them? Because if so, I'm very. I'm, if there were ghosts, I'd be very concerned because I've done a lot of things. I'm hoping nobody saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I really hope that they don't exist, but I'm not the type of person. I don't think that they do, but I'm also it's one of those things where it's like back of your head. It's Maybe. it would. Yeah, it would scare me if it did exist. And that's just because of the movies I've seen over the years. I really do attribute that fear because I didn't have it when I was younger. And I mm. think so watching it over time, it created a fear for me, especially after I lost someone. And I was always told like very re- I had a very religious family so everybody was like oh they'll always be watching over you they're always with you and I'm what like that terif- freaks me out what a terrifying like thing that. to tell kids right hey they're always gonna be watching you <laughs> everything you do I- as you walk to your car as you take a poo poo as you-, <laughs> you know it's just like ew why are they stalking me? I distinctly remember it started. You served your time. Go enjoy the heavenly gates. <laughs> I distinctly remember as a child, though, when I was in the shower, I was taking a shower and I remembered that's when it hit me. And I thought about like all of the ghost movies I'd seen. And I was like, what if they're standing like right in front of me and watching me? And I was like, it freaked me out. So ever since then, I've had like this weird, irrational fear. It's not like a phobia. So it's not like... 
I can still go to sleep and think about ghosts or whatever before bed. It might freak me out a little bit, but I can handle it. But spiders, no, no. Doesn't matter how big or small. If there's a spider here, we're stopping the podcast. <laughs> this is true. I've actually witnessed this. It's, <laughs> it's happened. I'll be honest. If there's a bee here, I would I would leave. Yeah, I'd be done. Yeah, I'd be gone. I, I have literally abandoned people, friends, family, whatever, at every every chance I could when a people? bee showed up. Yeah, I've literally abandoned people. I've left parties because there was a couple of bees. I'm like, I'm out. See you guys. I'm not doing this because I'm legitimately petrified of of bees. I'm phobic. Yeah. So no. No, and I um, I have good reason. I'll talk about that. Well, I guess we could, that's a good segue. Give me one example of even one instance where a movie forced you to face a fear for the better. Not for the worse, for the better. Okay, so I created a fear of Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street when I was a, a youthful child because I had parents or a parent who didn't let me watch a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have, and I was fine with almost everything. But this movie in particular, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's because it, like... Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one's terrifying. It is really scary. It's really but well But I watched yeah. Halloween, and that's like real people that can kill you with a knife coming into your house, and that didn't bother me. Scream. because he takes so that long to get me. there. I mean, <laughs> you can't outrun your dreams, you know? You can outrun Michael you Myers. You can't. And it was like, that was the scary part, is like, you go to, you want to go to sleep, and you're just like, oh my god, what if I go to sleep, and he kills me in my sleep? So it was very scary. How is this for the better? Hold on, I'm okay, getting there. all right. So I was, I was petrified. I didn't even watch this movie by myself. I remember I was dating this guy when I was really young and like I wanted to watch the movie and I tried to watch it and I was like texting him or whatever. Okay. And I, I had to stop it. I was like, I'm a child. I was I was a teenager and I had to still stop the movie because I couldn't handle it. Well, then. Why? It sounds like you weren't even paying attention to it. <laughs> I was, but it was freaking me out. So I told him I stopped it. Then in 2010, mm-hmm. they remade the movie. Mm-hmm. And I went and I saw this remake. I'm sorry. Me too. But I'm also very happy because it made me not scared of Freddy Krueger anymore. It was oh. so bad oh. that it erased my fear of the original Freddy Krueger. Now I can watch the original Freddy Krueger and I'm not scared anymore. That's fascinating. Isn't it weird? Yeah, that's kind of weird. It was just so bad that it took. I was like, are you kidding me? That's what I've been scared of? And it just took it away. Like, now I, I can still appreciate the original. It doesn't take that away from me. But I'm not irrationally scared of the movie. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's the only movie that's happened with. Really? Yeah. It's like, if you're scared about something, you're always scared about it or, or never scared about yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. So isn't it like Poltergeist, isn't that one of your most terrifying? Are you still frightened of that one? I'm not scared of it. I don't know. Maybe I was scared when I was a child and I don't remember. You talked on the show before. About, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's it was one of my favorites. So at the same time, I still watched it. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it's one of your favorites. Yeah, it's one okay. of my favorites. But I did have a bad dream about Scream when I was a child, even though that's one of my favorite horror movies, too. And that was just like... I remember I had a bunk bed and I had this dream that all of these these ghost faces came into my bedroom with knives and they were going to kill me in my bed. And then like I woke cult, up. Like a cult of ghost faces? <laughs> well, you know how they have a, multiple a of them? A gaggle of ghost faces? <laughs> and then I went to the bathroom and I went back to bed and I didn't think about it. But I can still picture the dream now. As an Weird. adult, I can still see it, but I'm not scared of it, and I didn't have any more bad dreams about it. Okay. So I guess sometimes it goes away. It's very weird <laughs> how my fears weird. work. <laughs> okay, well, here's what, here's mine that was for the better. It's going to sound weird, but it's true. Jaws, we're going to talk a little bit about Jaws later when we get to listener comments, but that's a movie that, that really kind of uh, terrified me. It made me refuse to get in the ocean. I had a hard time with it for the longest time. Then I watch Free Willy, and I'm not making this up. I watch Free Willy, and you know, because it's a it's a kids movie. I watch it with my kids, and it's it's such a charming, sweet little movie about a gigantic killer whale. And I I don't know why, but after that, I was open to going in the ocean again. And I hadn't I hadn't been in the ocean because of Jaws since I was a kid. And he, well, actually, I don't think I'd ever been in there other than like to my ankles. Because of Jaws. Free Willy made me feel like, oh, you know what? They're not all bad. Maybe I'll be fine. So I'm, and I'm being completely sincere, after Free Willy, I was able to go into the water at the ocean again. That is really weird. But at the same time, it makes sense because you like took away the bad. You replaced the bad with something that was positive and good. Yeah, it's really a, like a beautiful movie. I love that movie. So it was very charming. Did you like the eight that followed the first? No. Mm-mm. 
No. Free Willy 2 is okay, but then it got stupid. And <laughs> Just too much. Yeah. So, But I, the first one's very charming. It's a very good movie. I really enjoyed it. Really cured my fear. Now flip that. So give me at least one example where a movie forced you to face a fear and then it went poorly. I'm giving you two. Okay. There's two examples. I bet you they both have spiders in them. They do. Okay. One is arachnophobia. And really? the other is, this one's even worse. Because arachnophobia, in terms of listener picks, that was one of the most popular ones. Of So they're right on in line with you. Like many, many people mentioned arachnophobia as a movie that petrified them. Eight-legged freaks. That movie that's like so cartoony. scared the shit out of me. It's so cartoony. It does not matter. And I know they were like giant, like they look like robotic spiders, basically, because they're think so they bad. Were, yeah. <laughs> it was really bad graphics. CGI. But it just the concept of having spiders so big that they could crush my because everybody always tells you this is a favorite line. I always hear, they can't hurt you, they're so small. Okay, well, what if they were giant, giant dinosaur-sized spiders that could crush me with, like, uh, one of their little hairs? I can't even think about it. Well, first off, people are dumb because they can't hurt you. They can. Uh, yeah, brown recluse, it can, you know. Oh, God, take, I can't even handle thinking about now, this Now, tarantulas anymore. can't hurt you. That's a uh, myth. Okay, let's stop talking that's about this. No, I mean, that's part of the topic. Sorry. But arachnophobia is a movie I love. Yeah. Absolutely love it. Well, you're not movie. afraid of spiders, it, though. I don't like them. Like, I don't want to hang out and have a party. We're not going to have a, a, a soiree later. <laughs> that movie is probably the the one spider movie I have a hard time watching because they present real spiders. Yeah. Like, Eight-Legged Freaks, to me, it's just like a monster movie. It's That's like watching Godzilla, to me. It's, it's, not, it's not scary. It's to so me. outlandish. And I don't know why I was so scared of it, but I just remember, like... Well, it's I, like I, your nightmares I, being gigantic. Yes. I remember watching them when I was a kid, and that... That was pretty scary. God, no. Giant ants. Just none of it. I also don't like... See, I don't even like ants. I don't even know how... So I used to love um, A Bug's Life when I was a child. a little different. cartoon. I watched it now and I was like, no, man, I got to turn this off. <laughs> no. That's irrational. No. That's irrational. But I still say Ractophobia is a really good movie. Though. That's, like, that's like one of the most enjoyable... I, w- I wouldn't even call it a horror movie. More like a comedy because there's a lot of humor in it. It's, there is. It's really funny. And Jeff Daniels and John John Goodman's great in that movie. It's just like a fun movie to watch. But yeah, the spiders are they, you do get a little creepy tingly because they're real spiders. Okay. Hmm. So, uh I've got The Swarm. That is a, a movie. I'm petrified of bees. I talked about that and I have a, a genuine issue with giant bugs in general. I just I don't like giant bugs. I don't know why. But Swarm is an awful garbage dumpster of a movie. It's just so bad. It's Michael Michael Caine took it so he could buy a house. That's li- literally what he said. I used that money, I bought a house. So he did the movie because he liked paychecks. And it terrified me as a kid because these bees were doing everything I had experienced as a kid. See, I was stung like 130 some times as a kid. Two summers in a row. It was an awful, awful 130 existence. times each summer no, or combined? total 130 plus times. So I've been stung a lot. You know, I still I still have nightmares of my grandma pulling the stingers out one mm. by one by one by one. Where'd they sting you at? Everywhere. Like? Everywhere. In your booty? Everywhere. Yeah, I got swarmed. Like, legitimately, the swarm happened to me on a- Oh, wow. Once on a roof and once on a playground. They love me. So I don't like bees. <laughs> um, and I watched this movie and- it made my my already existence existing fear like ten times worse. So mm-hmm. it was really really not a good thing to watch. But I was trying to watch it because I've always been a fan of do do that thing you're afraid of. I've always tried to do that. If I am scared of something, I will try to do it to try to get over it. Bees are the one thing I've gotten better as I've gotten older. But I still will abandon a small child if I can to avoid being stung by a bee. That's unhealthy. It might be bee. <laughs> but I would not be stung. I would let the child. I would actually hold the child up like a shield. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I saw a swarm coming, I'd be take like, "Take it. him!" <laughs> so it's yeah, it, it's something that's irrational. But that that movie did Yikes. not not help at all, at all. And them is up there too. Like I, that one got me. Giant bugs. I don't like them. I don't think there's many B movies. There's not, and there's never been a really good one. Which, you know, the Wicker Man, I guess the original Wicker Man was a little scary. Yeah. For some people, I didn't find it. I mean, yeah, it's a horrible way to die. 
because that's my nightmare. Yeah. But it didn't really scare me at all. Hmm. So listener picks. We each uh, pick three comments or films to to read and discuss. Uh, my first one comes from Jessica Farrell. She says, anything Ouija. Stupid mm. Exorcist started a real fear about that one. A Ouija a re- origin of evil was horrifying to me. Does that kind of stuff scare you? You talked about ghosts, but like Ouija no, and spirits when I was, and um, demons. How old was I? I had to have been probably like 11 or something. And I found dial-up internet. And so I tried to be, like, charmed and buffy and tried to, like, see if I could be a witch or whatever. So, no, I think I probably brought trauma onto myself by trying to invoke the spirits of, like, witchcraft as a child. Because they had all these websites because it was when the internet was really starting to get a boom for, <laughs> for things like this. So, no. 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 I... Don't buy into any of that. So none of the exorcist, everyone tells, it's my mom's, I believe, favorite horror movie. Mm. You believe? Well, it's that or the birds. Those are two that she's really close to because she's terrified of birds, which is ironic that she loves that movie. But she, she's, I get the facing my fear thing from my mother. And, but she loves the exorcist. Like it terrified her and she made me watch it with her. She made me watch every horror movie with her. And that was one where I laugh like the whole time. I'm like, this is stupid. This, I just don't – I never found it scary, but it's also only terrifying if you buy into it, and I don't buy into it. it. It's really hard to buy into the concept, but it does freak me. Like, it makes me cringe a little bit when they're, like, body snaps, and they go in, like, weird positions. Yeah, when, those, they, when they released the new version when she spider crawls or whatever, yeah, that was pretty freaky. Yeah, those things, those things get me just because it's like, that's not normal. <laughs> Uh, and she's jamming the cross in her hoo hoo. Yeah. That's that's not normal. What? Gosh, weird things happen. <laughs> weird things. All right, what's your first listener pick? Uh, my first comes from Bessie Adit. Okay. Adut. I don't know how you say it, Bessie. What's that? But- Adut. <laughs> Is she Canadian? And she said, Rosemary's baby made me not want to have a baby for life. (laughs) Uh, I could imagine that to be the case, especially if you were like if she watched in her prime, like youthful teenage years, that would traumatize a person. You really believe that you're going to be impregnated with the spawn of Satan? Have you seen some of these children running around now? I'm not disagreeing with that. That's probably a good point. <laughs> there's there's a lot of I think that's more of a parenting issue. That is. Yeah. But Spank the devil kids. the devil's in all y'all. Ground your kids. Take the phones away. It's okay. <laughs> Take it away. Snatch it up. So one that many, many people mentioned was Jaws, and I want to talk about Jaws. That that is a movie that number one, I want to say, holds up on repeat viewings. It's it's an amazing movie mm-hmm. that it still holds up thirty five, forty five years later. And feels like a movie that almost looks made today. I mean, it's just so well done, well crafted, taught, suspenseful. Enjoyable. I also think you should watch the making of if yeah, you haven't before. The documentary on it that's on the Blu-ray is, is fascinating. Yeah. It's wonderful. Watch even that. if you watch like the clips and just to get an understanding of what the shark was and how they made that and all of the issues that they encountered in production. Yeah, the reason it's so terrifying is because they couldn't use they it. They couldn't use it. <laughs> yeah, and shark's broken. Shark's yeah. broken. So what did, what did you – you're younger than mm-hmm, I am. Mm-hmm. I obviously grew up with that movie. So my generation, I mean, dun, 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 dun. Right. I mean, that you guys was, watched it in pools probably. Yeah, that theme song came on everywhere you went, man. You just, you're at school and people be like, dun, 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 dun. But you're of a younger generation. Do you guys – would you watch it? Like, uh, is that yeah. a, is that a big movie for your generation? Like, do people we're still all, watch it? Yeah, we're all still very aware of it. I think generations even younger than me are still aware of it, and they still know the reference, even if they haven't seen the movie. It's just become that much of a classic and iconic. And anytime you're in the ocean, if somebody's like afraid of a shark, they reference Jaws or they make the sound, they, they make mm-hmm. the music. And that's what I think is like really powerful about that movie is that it's transcending through so many generations and still affecting and creating fear within people who have never even seen the movie. Like I did it made make did you it make me scared? fearful of water at all? Um, because the sharks are real, not yeah. necessarily thirty footers, but the sharks are real. Well, I'm scared of the ocean in general because I'm afraid of anything that might be in there. Even fish freak me out. Like I had fish touch my legs one time, and I was like, ah. But also, uh, a few years ago, I went into the ocean, and within probably the first like thirty minutes or whatever, our group had seen a shark there, mm-hmm. and it was at the Shark Bite Capital of the World or whatever in New Smyrna Beach. 
in Florida. Yeah, at least. So I I'm wanted out. to get – yeah, we got out pretty quickly. But I still think of Jaws when it happens, but the movie didn't freak me out necessarily. And I was also pretty aware of the making of, which I mm. think helps a lot in taking away some of the yeah, fear. But I also think that it's really, really important for you to understand that piece of filmmaking, just like Rear Window and like all of the – I, I reworkings and dealing with change and issues on a production set and the way that those things have actually created fantastic pieces in cinema history. Yeah, it's a, one of the most notable stories in cinema in terms of making of a film and also just in terrorizing people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's still people I know today that are afraid of going into the ocean because of that movie. And I still think of it every time I go in, even though Free Willy helped. I still get in there <laughs> and go like, man, they do bite stuff. And so, you know, I remember all the details that I learned from Richard Dreyfuss in that movie because I'm like, well, he was a shark guy. I mean, obviously, he's he knows what he's talking about. And I've actually gotten out there and I'm like, you know, I feel like I'm Quint. I'm like, how how do I harpoon a shark if I tend to see one? There, is there a harpoon handy out here? Can I get to it before the shark gets me? Punch him in the eyes. Yeah, all that stuff doesn't really work, I don't think. I think once a shark bites you, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> And now we're going to hear from Tony Moran. This is just a snippet from the full interview that we had with him, the original face of Michael Myers. He's going to tell you a few things about Donald Pleasance, Jamie Lee Curtis, the mask, and getting confused with the shape. Here's Tony Moran, and then we'll be back with Halloween Kills. And I know a lot of people don't realize this, but you only worked on the film for, for one day, right? Right. Yeah, yeah it was a 21-day shoot. Uh, and like... like uh, uh, Donald Pleasance was only on it for five days, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it was uh, a very fast shoot and, you know, John Carpenter really didn't do any takes longer than three, three takes. Really? So yeah, because of the money, yeah. there just wasn't enough money. And so everything was fast and he had everything. He was brilliant, you know, and a really nice, he's a good guy. He's a real good guy, and, but he was brilliant because Man, on every every scene, he had everything blocked out ahead of time in his head and everything. So it was very very well organized and you know and and quick. Well, I've read that you signed and, on for this because Donald Pleasance was in it. Is that is that true? Why was he so that's important? That's the only that's the only reason why I went on the interview. That's exactly right. My, you know, back then, Aaron, if you did a, a horror movie, that was just like a half a step better than up better than doing a, you know, like soft porn or pornography. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was the only way, the only way you could see tits and ass in, in a, in a, in a movie was either porn or, or horror. So if a producer and director heard that you did a horror movie, they thought that you degraded yourself and, and sold out mm. because it was, it just wasn't the same as it is now. I mean, it was nowhere near, it's nowhere near, you know what I mean? So did he live up to your so, expectations? Yes, he did. did he? he did. He, yeah, he wasn't really um, uh, a, a friendly guy. He wasn't unfriendly, but he he was a you know he he kind of kept to himself. And but he, his acting, yeah, it was it was brilliant, it, brilliant. And he he wasn't their first choice, Aaron. He he was like their fourth or fifth choice. Uh, everybody else had like you know Christopher. Um, oh, what's his name? Christopher uh, Lee. Well, Lee Chris. Yeah, Christopher Lee. He he turned it down. There's a there's a the top heavyweights at the time turned it down as, as, as far as horror heavyweights. Mm -hmm. They all turned it down, and he took it. And the reason why he took it, I found out later, is because he needed the alimony money because <laughs> he was on his like fifth or sixth divorce or something. Yeah, yeah. swear to God, <laughs> that figures. And then, yeah, and then later on in his life, you know, he said that doing Halloween was absolutely the very best thing that ever happened to his career. And that just, I thought that was just great to hear. You know what I mean? Because Jamie Lee Curtis for years didn't want to be associated with Halloween. And by the way, she didn't want to do the movie either. Her mom is the one that talked her into it. Really? Janet Lee. Yeah. She said, because she, she read the script and she kind of, she kind of knew who John Carpenter was kind of, because he had done Assault on Precinct 13th or whatever. But she, she kind of knew, she said, you know, look at, you do this movie, and if it becomes a hit, you'll be you'll be on your way like in no time, you know. And so, her mom is the one that that talked her into doing the movie. 
if anybody knows what <laughs> what a horror movie could do for your career, it's probably Janet Lee. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Were you pretty happy that Donald Pleasance is the guy that shot you then? Yo, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and if you watch this scene, it's pretty funny, man. Uh, you know, I did this stunt, you know, on the first shot. I flew my, uh, they, they said, you know, yeah, you're going to get shot here, you know. And I go, okay, uh, you want me to, like, because I was so athletic. You know, I, thought, mm-hmm. I said, you know, you want me to, like, throw myself around or something, you know. And they go, can you? I'm like, yeah, I can do that. So I flung myself backwards when he sh- shoots me. And then uh, I did that robotic move with the next, you know, shots, right? Right. In the in the bedroom. But if you count, there's a total of seven shots coming out of a six shooter. <laughs> so he shoots me once, right? Right. And he said, I shot him six times. No, you shot me seven times, bro. But anyways, <laughs> and then when it when it's in the ba- in the bedroom, it, it, it cuts to that scene and he's shooting me. There's another six shots. So there's seven coming out of a 38 revolver, you know? That's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's a little known, a little unknown fact. Yeah. Yeah, And this is one, I know you've been asked this a million times, but if you don't ask it, people get mad. In in the 70s, you know, (laughs) psycho killers, they were never masked. And then here comes this part where you got a random guy and you're wearing a William Shatner mask, which I think you didn't even know at the time. But now, now it's a classic. But then it was this low-budget horror flick. So did that mask ever strike you as a really odd choice at the time? Um, yes, it did. And here's how that happened, how they figured out that mask. They knew that they were going to use a clown mask when, when uh, Michael Myers is six years old, right? Right. But they, but they absolutely knew that they were not going to use a clown mask when he, when he became 21. But they didn't have any idea of what they wanted to use. They didn't have a clue. Mm-hmm. So Tommy Lee Wallace, who was the editor and the set decorator on this on the movie, and he he's actually the one that did the closet scene as Michael Myers, or the shape, whatever you want to call it. Right. He he's actually the one that did that scene because he knew he had to punch his punch through the the wood slats of the door, right? And he knew exactly where you know where to do it every single time, so that they. They spent as least amount of money replacing those wood slats on every take as possible, and that's how low budget the film was. And so he's the one that did that thing. But anyways, he was in charge of finding something, and he didn't. Nobody knew what they wanted, so he went around on in Hollywood to all the stores, you know, costume places and Halloween stores and so so forth. And he came across that that mask, and he said that he. When he saw it, he kind of, it was like flesh colored, you know, and had mm-hmm. more sideburns on it and stuff like that. But he said he stood in front of it and he, he looked at it and he just kind of tripped out because there was really nothing to it. It was, it was kind of featureless, you know? And so he thought, man, if we just kind of like paint it white and stuff, take the flesh color off of it and, and cut the, you know, the hair, some of the hairs off it, it could be pretty creepy because there's nothing to it. And that's how the mask came about. And plus, they were only a dollar eighty nine a piece. <laughs> uh, it's no lie. I, su- I swear, it's no lie. That's that's the, that's the true story. So when I saw it, you know, I didn't know. See, I was never told I had to wear a mask. Right. Uh, you know, which you probably heard before. Yeah, I've heard that one. So what? What? Yeah. When I came there, I was like, Oh God, what are you kidding me? You know, I got to wear a mask in this movie because back then. There was no masks involved. It was all makeup usually, right? Right. On horror movies. This was really the first movie that introduced a mask. And and I was just livid, you know, But because I already signed a contract and everything. And I, didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to break that. And I was broke. So I needed the money, too. So uh, so I did it. But, yeah, I, I, it, 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 it struck me as a weird mask. But, it, but it, I, you know, I didn't. I didn't care, you know, I just wanted to do the scene and and get it over with and, and get, you know, get going, you know. And you had to wear Vaseline in your hair, that whole thing to keep, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, because I had a lot of hair. I I shaved my head now, (laughs) but yeah, you know, the mask is 100% latex, so to get it to slide off the head without any, any effort, you just put Vaseline in it and uh, it slides right off. But then you have to take that Vaseline and out of your hair. And that's that was apple cider vinegar that yeah. I had to use <laughs> to cut the oil. Yeah. 
Hey, crazy. Let, let me ask you a question because so many people basically feel like they're experts on Halloween at this point. You know, so many people have researched it. Is there anything about the yeah. lo- the lore that people just get wrong in your opinion or, um, or misunderstand? You know what? Yeah, you know what's happening lately. It's really weird, and it's like like a, a click or something. But there's a lot of people that really don't read, you know, or maybe they don't know how to read or something. <laughs> okay. And they 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 call like um like like say Nick Castle, Michael Myers, and he wasn't Michael Myers. He was the shape, and I got the credit as Michael Myers. And it's in the credits. You know, I didn't do it. You know, John Carpenter did that. You know right, what I mean? Right. And so these people are pissed off that I that because I'm only in this in this in the movie for the last scene, even though there was a total of six different people that wore the mask in that movie. Even Deborah Hill did a, a few scenes with you know with the with the with the get up on. These people are like you know on the side of they're like they're taking they like. It's weird. They take like sides or something. And it's like, what is wrong with you? You know, it's like <laughs> even when, when Nick Castle signs, he signs it the shape because that was his credit. Right. That's the, that's the official thing, you know? And that's where people get really messed up. In fact, I saw a post just a few days ago on, on uh, uh, a comment on a post that somebody else made. And, you know, Facebook will notify you if your name is mentioned. Right. So I go right. there. Oh, no, it was Instagram. It was Instagram. And this guy goes, no, he, he, no, Tony Moran didn't play Michael Myers. He played, he, he, he was the one that played the, the guy that was unmasked in the movie. Well, and like, what? Well, that's, Mike, <laughs> that's Michael Myers. Uh, it's really a weird post. And I thought the yeah. guy may, may have been drunk or something. Who knows? You know what I mean? All I say to, say to my fans is, look at, this is the credit I got. I'm, I'm not trying to brag or do anything it's just the fact you know i got the credit as michael myers the original michael myers because it the original comes from it was the original movie you mm-hmm. know what i mean yep and is but some people are just they're weird about it um that's the biggest thing right now is what's going on is, is my point well they showed your face you're michael myers as far as i'm concerned i know i know i know <laughs> You know, because you're on set, it's a low budget horror flick. You're not sure where this thing is going to go. When did you actually, at the time, realize this is going to be yeah. huge? Yeah, good point. Good point. You know, I was uh, we we shot in April, and in August, I get a an invitation from John Carpenter or whatever the production you know crew uh, to go see the a screening of the movie for the cast and crew. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was the most hilarious thing I ever heard, and I threw the, I just threw the invitation away because I knew it was going to be a piece of crap, and nobody's ever going to see it, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I don't know. It's like five or six months in that the movie was done, right? And um, the movie I found out later was released in podunk theaters across America, and basically because no, you know, no studios wanted to buy the movie yet. You know what I mean? Because it was a horror movie. Nobody, you know, didn't think it was going to blow up. Yeah, but the famous uh, film critics at the time saw the movie, you know, like Eve Siskel and Ebert, and gave it a thumbs up and everything. You know, it, everybody loved it, right? So when that happened, you know, then it started playing at the really good theaters. Uh, so I'm I'm driving my Volkswagen down Sunset Boulevard and uh, towards the freeway to get on the freeway after working, and I I'm going by a town that's called Westwood, a very famous place in that area for a date night to go to uh, dinner and movies because the theaters are beautiful and huge and, and old and all that. And he, he even showed it on uh, Quentin's movie, uh, Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood, that, that town. So anyway, I see this, this billboard of Halloween on, on Sunset Boulevard while I'm driving. And I, I'm, I'm shocked. I I'm, I'm just can't believe this. And, I'm, and I see it and I go, you got to be kidding me. This movie's got a billboard in like Beverly Hills type area, you know? And so I start looking around and the movie's playing everywhere. It's playing everywhere. And it's like, like I said, about five or six months in. And back then there's no, you know, the only way you could see a movie was if it was still in the theaters because there's no blockbusters or on demand or anything like that, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I, I noticed it's playing everywhere and I, I turned my girlfriend that night or the next day or whatever. And I go, have you noticed that this movie's playing everywhere? 
And she said, yeah, I, you know, I kind of noticed that. You know, I go, well, you want to see it or, you know? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, why not? Fuck it, you know? So we go, and we go see it. And it's packed, and, and uh, people are screaming at the, the movie screen to duck and run and all that, you know? And I get halfway through, and I turned her, and I went, you know, this movie's not too bad. <laughs> and that's how I saw it. Wow. And that's how I figured out it was really big. You know what I mean? And then... They called me up to do Halloween 2, which I got the credit for, although I didn't step foot on, you know, I didn't do any filming because I told them no. But they said, okay, well, can we use your footage of your face in, from Halloween 1 and put it in Halloween 2 and we'll pay you and give you the credit? I'm like, sure. Sounds good to me. <laughs> what a great job. <laughs> Halloween kills, but it's streaming on Peacock, so it's streaming somewhere, so you can watch it at home safely. <laughs> you can. I wouldn't recommend. Well, you know what? I actually, I don't know. I don't, I'm very mixed about this. I feel like you should still probably go see it in theaters if you're planning to watch it, but just be prepared for it to not be the best. Is, is there really a way to be the best of a Halloween? Be movie? the original. Fair enough. Point. <laughs> Point set match. So our spoiler for review, Halloween Kills. Halloween night with Michael Myers returned. It isn't over yet. It's not done. He's not done with apparently everyone in Haddonfield. He's going to kill them all. <laughs> Minutes after Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis and her daughter Karen, Judy Greer, and granddaughter Allison, Annie Matachik. Ooh, I think I got that right the first time. Left masked monster Michael Myers caged and burning in Lori's basement. Lori's rushed to the hospital with life-threatening injuries, believing she finally killed her lifelong tormentor. But when Michael manages to free himself from Lori's trap, his ritual bloodbath resumes. As Lori fights her pain and prepares to defend herself against him, she inspires all of Haddonfield to rise up against their unstoppable monster. The Strode women join a group of other survivors of Michael's first rampage who decide to take matters into their own hands forming a vigilante mob that sets out to hunt Michael down once and for all. And we should point out, there's a lot of returning characters from the original film. You got Anthony Michael Howell's Tom Doyle, Tommy Doyle coming back. You have Lindsay coming back. There's a lot of characters that come back from the original that are in this film. I'm not going to say what their fate is or anything here, but I just want to point out that they also added some backstory. They added some police officer drama. <laughs> they did. How did you feel first of that? How do you feel about them adding story elements to the existing movie? Because that made for a completely mm. different story, especially for Officer Hawkins, who survived, by the way. Shh. Spoiler alert. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like it takes away some of the brutality of Michael when it wasn't him that actually murdered the cop. It was this other dumb cop who did it. So that makes it. I have I don't have a problem with adding backstory when it makes sense. I do have a problem with changing changing elements of the original story. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, well, I, I don't know if that did that cop ever that never came up. I don't think. You got to remember this is very important and it's very confusing for a lot of people because these movies are all over the place because Jamie Lee Curtis already had her <laughs> return in H two O, but apparently they just return yep. returned her. And ignored that movie completely. Where's Josh Hartnett in all this? So <laughs> uh, this this movie, these movies, these three movies, which is Halloween, Halloween Kills, and then Halloween Ends, which comes out next year. Those three movies. Spoiler alert. Are, <laughs> I'm just letting you know it's coming. It's happening. Uh, are directly um, coming off of the original movie. Now, in the original movie, they didn't show how they captured Michael That's Myers. true. So that's true. That's not a backstory that we've actually seen, only heard about, kind of. So, and the other movies, Halloween 2, Halloween 3, obviously not connected, 4, 5, 16, 14, 19, I don't remember where the numbers are, but all those other movies don't count. It's Halloween 1978, and then the Halloween from 2018, and this one and the next one. I still feel like it takes away some of the power of him, though. I, I realize that it's based on the perception, because when... When they approach the house, the officer doesn't, you know, he he says that it's Michael. He doesn't say, oh, I, ac I accidentally shot the guy trying to get Michael because Michael was going to kill him. I mean, I think we all know that. But that does detract from some of the power, in my opinion, from from an outsider's perspective 
of, oh, okay, so that wasn't even him. But I do think it adds an interesting twist to it because I fully didn't expect it to go that way. And it, and it makes you – I can see why someone would be more terrified of him coming back because – they saw what he was capable of and they survived. And there's not that many people who have survived Michael. True. And it is kind of an awkward <laughs> death, I guess, for for Pete McCabe, Officer Pete McCabe. He's played by Jim Cummings, by the way, who's actually been on our show for Thunder Road, which he did a few years ago. So He's a, he's a great He's director. done a lot of good movies lately. Yeah. He's a very good writer and director, so you should definitely look up his work. As soon as I saw him in the titles, I was like, yay! I was kind of bummed because he's a cop in uh, Thunder Road. And he plays Jim McNaud. I was kind of hoping he'd have that name or something just as a nice oh, little tie. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. yeah. They, didn't, they didn't do that. All right. So in this story, essentially, Michael Myers survives the trap that was set. Barely burnt. I would say barely. I mean. That, I, yeah. Right? He got a little singe on his mask, but I think he was overall fine. <laughs> Looks like a little bit like a candle was left out a little too long. Or maybe a marshmallow that when you're, a little you know, too Have long. you been to a hibachi restaurant and they start, they do the fire in front of you? Yeah. And it's it like comes at you and it feels really hot. That's the equivalent of what he experienced. <laughs> he was like, ooh, that's a little warm. Yeah, that's basically it. And then he uh, proceeds to, you know, take out a bunch of firefighters. And I'm, that's, I'm only saying that, I know that's kind of a spoiler for those that are concerned. On the same token, they made a big deal about it because people wanted that pulled from the movie. They wanted the whole scene excised because, you know, it was a shameful insult to firefighters. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, they were kind of trying to be heroes at the moment. So not really. And it's a horror movie. I, I, honestly, everybody, everybody dies. Everybody's got a shot at dying. Literally, everyone in this movie has a shot at dying. Yeah. I don't know. Then I would say that it's um, it's offensive to the babysitters. Who died? <laughs> That's where we should start. Why are you going after babysitters? Huh? Why do children. you feel the need? Why do you feel the need to attack the people that sit our children? You know what I mean? They're doing a very hard job. Nobody wants to they do. do. And they're underpaid. Always. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So what did you think about this storyline? The whole storyline is he's coming back. And we don't want to say where he's headed because I don't want to spoil that aspect of it for anybody. But on the same token, we did learn in the last movie that he's not actually on a beeline for Laurie Strode because they're not actually related in this version. All the other versions they were in this version, they're not. I th I still think that's a weird way to. Can I just ask you in respect to that? Sure. Does that bother you? Do you think that's just like uh, a weird change when every other movie I realize that we're ignoring all those movies? But on the same token, that's a big shift that we're not related to Laurie Strode. It doesn't bother me as much because to me, I look I look at the original, the 1978, and that's what is canon, if you will. I don't see all of the follow-ups as being canon. Maybe I should, I don't know, but I don't. So I kind of base it on Michael as the character in the first one, their, you know, his relationship with Lori in there, and there was no indication that they were related. So I'm fine if somebody's like, you know what, this kind of veered off in a weird way. I have a cooler, better idea where they don't have to be related, but she just essentially wants to take him out because of all of the trauma she's experienced. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Okay. I like the angle of it. I, I like the survival angle, the survivalist angle. Yeah. I mean, some of that aspect I, I do really like. I just I just feel like, I mean, essentially you're changing my entire childhood because I, I grew up thinking they were related. Yeah, but I feel like Michael, at least in the first one, he didn't feel that intentional. Like the way I've always perceived Michael Myers is that he's – his mind isn't there. It doesn't exist. Like he's just a robot that if you, if you get, he's just going to try to get home. That's all he cares about is getting home. And I really liked that they brought that to this movie where it's like, if you get in his way, he's going to murder you. Mm -hmm. But if you stay out of his way, he's not going to go super far out of his way to kill you. But at the same time, he did, you know, he had some stalking. So did it was it just somebody that caught his eye or you know so maybe there was some more intentionality to his character well there's less babysitters um, working right now 
because they're all everybody's freaking out because this guy's on the loose. So he's just yeah. got to kill regular people now. <laughs> what a bummer. He's got to kill firefighters instead. <laughs> exactly. That's the next something. heroic worker. <laughs> they're the next step up from babysitters. Like it's yeah, babysitters, yeah, yeah. firefighters. I mean, do you want to deal with your four-year-old and your two-year-old? That's no, call. that's why you paid someone. That's really a good so, call if you think about it. Who's the hero? I'm just kidding. Now, this this movie has an angle of a vigilante mob, and obviously, there's a this was filmed before recent events of the past year and whatnot. So it's not like pu- pulling from that, just a happy coincidence, I guess. But this does kind of look at how people that are affected by trauma might react in in the face of additional trauma. And now they're saying it's a new angle, but they've kind of approached this in different ways in other movies where, you know, the a killer's on the loose and a bunch of them get together and they end up killing the wrong person or something along those lines. But that's not quite what happens here. But it is very much a vigilante mob that goes after people just assuming they're Michael Myers. So what did you think of this aspect of using survivor's guilt to kind of fuel this mob to go after the mighty Michael Myers. Seems like a dumb plan, honestly, when you see how many people he's killed. Yeah, but I actually did like it because it's it adds an insight, which is a little more unusual to a slasher flick, to posing the question of like, given the right circumstances, everybody has some demon inside of them and it can easily be manipulated based on our fears Mm. and based on our trauma. Um, When you think about people who defend themselves and they black out and they have no idea how much brutality they've done, it's because their their fight or flight response has kicked in and they just do, you know, they kind of go haywire. And I think that's what what this was focusing on. And I kind of liked that is how chaotic – this serial killer can make an entire town because they've essentially been tormented and they are probably all have PTSD in in one way or another. And so definitely the chaos that it brings about to have that revived and to feel like they were that close to getting rid of him and to not have it done when they're like, you know what, let's just all get together and just go into, they kind of dive into their animalistic roots as humans, their protective instincts, and they say, nah, we're going to get this guy. It's not that easy because he's supernatural now. (laughs) It's been confirmed. Well, it's confirmed, but on the same token, the director keeps saying in interviews that he's not, that I believe he's Okay, but he said that in his script. Yeah. Like, there was literally conversation where where, where Laurie Strode is like, He's not human anymore. He's, he's beyond the point of, yeah, yeah he he's beyond the point of human. So, n- sorry about your interviews, but your <laughs> dialogue says the complete opposite. That's awesome. Your point of reference is wrong, plain and simple. I mean, look at right? your own movie. I mean, you made it. It's very simple. <laughs> Did like, you forget? <laughs> yeah. So, so that is that end of it. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of with you in that sense. I, I do like that they introduced that angle, the whole mom mentality. I thought t- Anthony Michael Hall was great as Tommy Doyle. Honestly, I mean, I, I honestly could follow a whole movie with him because he does. He's always been an actor that I've admired, especially after the 80s movies, because he kind of evolved and, and totally looks different. He's bulkier. He's more threatening, imposing. And... You know, he has moments where, where he realizes he was wrong about something, where he's he's exacting anger and rage and also carrying a lot of pain and guilt. And I think he does a very good job, especially for, you know, kind of a low-budget horror movie. Not to give it additional props just for that, but I th- he, he carried himself well. I really enjoyed Anthony Michael Hall's Tommy Doyle. Not quite yeah, Paul Rudd from the previous movie where Paul <laughs> Rudd was Tommy Doyle. Completely different take on the character. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now... There was an aspect that you didn't like because you actually like this movie less than I did, which which, which is, is surprising. It is surprising because I actually like the last movie less than you did, <laughs> mostly because yeah. I thought it was just a retread of H2O. Here, I felt at least I'm getting something fresh. So what what didn't you like about Halloween Kills? What really that you can say without getting too spoilery? Yeah, I won't get spoilery. But the, the funny thing is, I thought the reason why this 
hit me and made me not like it as much as I thought I would actually enjoy it because I did like the last one. I thought that would be the same reason you didn't like this because Danny McBride, who mm. I normally don't have a problem with, you have a problem with Danny McBride in I general. Sure don't like him. Yep. He's the same guy in everything. He's literally the he same is, guy in everything. But but even for writing credits, he doesn't bother me because usually I find it I, I I can get on his sense of humor. And don't get me wrong, there were moments where I did kind of like uh chuckle a little bit inside, but it was so forced with the humor in so many ways where it's like we're going to make this a horror comedy and that tonal shift for me that didn't exist as much in the last movie, certainly didn't exist in the first original movie, is now being brought in here. And I was just really taken back by it because it felt like it overpowered the 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 tension and it sliced through that and it took away from the impactful moments that should have been impactful. And don't get me wrong, I really did like Little and Big John who are the kind of stereotypical hippie gay guys or whatever. But Mm -hmm. there were just so many moments where it was so forced, like somebody goes into a room and they have to jump into the room because they're afraid he's there. And I was like, nah, no. And that's not, it's not that it's not on the actor. It's on the writing that's in direction. That's how they wanted it to be presented, presented. And I think that has to, this is my perception. It has to do with Danny McBride's influence. And typically, I don't have a problem with him, but this is just not the not the area for it for me. And it wasn't balanced. It's not like they tried to do it quippy and witty like Scream does humor. This is just, oh, we're just going to try to be funny. Yeah, I, I thought that some of the humor was, was forced. I mean, I, I do like when horror movies have a bit of that, you know, when they, when they have a, a, just a bit of comedy. Just a little bit, just to break the tension. You know what I mean? I I just really enjoy that in a good horror movie. It just, it did feel forced. (laughs) As does most of Danny McBride's comedy to me. (laughs) It just feels like somebody trying to jam a square peg into a round hole every time. Uh, It also felt like two completely different voices that were trying to merge in the movie. Because you have a more methodical or less methodical and more just using tension to create scare and anticipation and, um, you know, watching him stalk his prey sort of thing versus these jump scares. Like those are two very different and distinct approaches to a horror movie. And some of the kills were so grotesquely ridiculous that they wanted to make you laugh about it. And I was just like, I, I'm i fine. I love over the top. But like now you guys are trying to find a way to make Saw funny. And that's just not – I don't know. It just that tone felt so divided in the movie where sometimes it went that way and sometimes it didn't. Yeah. And and you brought up a, a comment, especially in your review, where you're, you're referencing your written review, which is available at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Love the plug. <laughs> you, you have a mention where – the, the way that Michael stages victims in this movie is just r- ridiculously out of character based on previous movies. And I would agree that to the, I would disagree that he never stages them because if you go watch the first movie, he definitely does some staging, you know, with not with Soul's candy character. sprinkled around them though. Right. And the silver shamrock masks. I mean, did he go and hunt down some silver shamrock masks? I don't understand. Cause I mean, I don't recall them just being handy. But I know the kids yeah. had some masks, I guess. So maybe you got them from them or whatever. But it just it just felt I agree with you in in that respect. There's a bunch of people that are laid out on a merry go round and they're placed silver shamrock hand uh masks on their heads. And it's just like, why is he taking the time to do this? I mean, that just feels like because it's a wide open space. That one really does feel out of character. It doesn't feel like Michael Myers. And I'm I'm not telling you who died. I'm just saying, you know, this is just the moment in the movie. There was candy perfectly sprinkled around because obviously they're from, you know, there's some trick or treating candy. It's Halloween night, right? Mm -hmm. But he like sprinkled candy around their bodies on the merry go round and also spun it before he left. So that way it would be spinning when the people (laughs) showed up. It was just like, (laughs) okay, man, how, first of all, those things don't last for more than 10 seconds in terms of spinning. 
And you've already told me as an audience member, he's far away from this by now. It's the wind. To- the wind. Wind yeah, is, so yeah, windy. With all so that windy. weight on it, the wind is blowing it around. Sure, but there's there's another posing, another staging that didn't bother me as much. It was like he used an image of someone that was like right next to their bodies and was like, "Oh, I'll prop you up like your picture." And it's like, "Oh, that's kind of you know, I can." That's more subtle in terms of staging. I'm cool with that. But when you start sprinkling candy and spinning the merry-go-round, that's when I start to go, hmm. And literally using the masks from Halloween three, I just why are why on earth are they still making them? You know what I mean? Just Did so. they buy them? So does <laughs> that also awesome. mean? And that that's kind of a trick. And I get it, it's an homage and whatnot, but on the same token. It's an homage to your own franchise. So you're kind of saying, well, that kind of thing did happen. <laughs> at yeah, some point. no, that's a good, that's actually a really good point. You because know, if you t- are paying an homage yeah. to a movie, you have to respect that timeline. And a little that too would meta. make a little too meta. all, yeah, all of these events not possible or skewed. So in review terms, if $10 is full price of admission, what do you give Halloween Kills? $5.50. I mean, Overall, it is still a movie that I enjoyed for being a horror movie. Like it was average. I would I would watch it, you know, but for a Halloween movie, that's where I didn't like it. Yeah, I would give it six. I mean, I fully enjoyed it. It was very much a, a Halloween movie. I actually like it more than I like the last movie, uh, probably because I think the last movie, it takes like an hour to get really get going. And yeah, that's true. And it also rehashed a lot of H2O, in my opinion. So to me, there wasn't a lot of fresh material. It was just basically the same movie over again. Just now we're, now they're not related. And that kind of annoyed me. I did love the ending of the third movie, or the, of the last movie. And this movie kind of makes me mad that they even made this movie. So because it kind of yep. retcons that really kick ass ending of the first movie where all three women fooled him and beat him. And now, of course, well, that didn't work. So it's a waste of time. Pisses me off in some way. And the one thing that's really pissing me off about David Gordon Green, who's the director and one of the writers, is he keeps showing us Michael's face. That was something I didn't like in the last one. And it's something I didn't like in this one. We don't have a full glimpse of his face like we did before. But even just putting a light on it from a distance where I can, you know, I can make out his facial features. Mm -hmm. Don't do that to me. Don't you do it. He (laughs) wears a mask for a reason and the audience should never see it. Okay. That's my opinion. I can respect that. And now we're going to go to the Halloween Horror Survival Guide where Justin McCumber, Brian Williams, and Scott Clark and I did a discussion on do's and don'ts. This is a much snippet from a much older episode, but I just thought it was kind of fun for this Halloween episode for you guys to check that out. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And then we're going to come back with psychological horror versus gore with myself, Amanda, and John Davenport. So those will be the the two segments that final this out. So thanks for listening to that. And remember, you can always find more information at thehollywoodoutsider.com. You can email us, feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com, and be sure to, uh, to do that. So I'm looking forward to Hearing from you guys and also be, be sure to check out past episodes, man. Share the wealth, share the, spread the love. Tell your friends that you will listen to The Hollywood Outsider. It helps. Now we're going to our From the Outside In topic this week. And we wanted to have a little bit of fun. Halloween's coming up. We always kind of do like a Halloween topic. We're, we're themed. We like to theme it every now and again. So this is basically our horror or movie survival guide. <laughs> yeah, that just happened. Horror. Horror. We're going to do the do's and don'ts of horror movies. But before we get to that, which is basically like every time we yell at somebody, don't do something, we have to tell, we have to say what the do should be. So we're going to do that. But before we get to it, why the hell does Hollywood still use so many cliches in horror films anyway? I mean, characters are constantly doing dumb things. Do do studios just want us yelling at the screen? Does anyone have any – Scott, what do you think? Do you think they just keep putting cliché after cliché after cliché because they know it works or what? Well, I think it does work to some extent, but for a couple of reasons. I mean, first off, what's cliché to us is a fresh idea to somebody else. Even though it's been done a million times, not everybody has seen every movie. Not everybody has watched nearly as many movies as critics like us do. There's there's always going to be some kind of new audience. And 
the second reason I think is that just some cliches just are never going never going to die, even though it, they're done over and over again. We're just always going to remember them. This is they're just not going to go anywhere. Two hundred episodes, and Scott finally said us instead of you guys. Good for you. It's about- <laughs> Nice job, Scott. <laughs> He's all grows up. <laughs> it's, it's like you've been watching movies for years now or something. Yeah, four years. Wow. Didn't watch any before that, but... I know. <laughs> Brian, what about you? What do you think? Why do they keep doing it to us? Yeah, they work. I mean, it's just plain and simple. Unfortunately, it works. It's it's crazy because Scott's exactly right. You know, they... they Is those that of us that are more part? Yeah, that's what's... My mind's blown over that. <laughs> You've got to, I mean, you've got to create some sort of anticipation and I don't know, they, they, it's so stupid and it's, and those of us that have seen a hundred movies, it's obvious to us and it's old hat and it doesn't scare us. But the good side of that is the silver lining, so to speak, is when you do see something that is fresh and different, you know, we're so amped about it. We kind of tell everybody else, you know, Hey, you got to see this movie. So, uh, I don't know. They, they work. Even those, even though we're expecting it, I think to, on some level it still works for for some of you know for those of us that are more, I guess, um, in tune or astute or whatever you want to call it. But um, in stew, is that what you said? Astute. Oh, astute. That makes more sense. Yeah, because <laughs> in a stew, just seems silly. Well, I think we're kind of jaded altogether anyway. Just just with horror movies in general. I was talking to uh, Zach from my show last night when we were recording and he was talking about how there are horror movies that it's hard to even get him to be even a little bit creeped out anymore. Horror movies are almost comical to him at this point because he's seen so many and nothing scares him anymore. Mm -hmm. But then if you go, go to any of these movies on opening night, there are hundreds of kids in there that have never seen some of this stuff and are screaming their heads off, having a blast because they're getting freaked out. That's they're, a really good point. Cheating. And I got to be honest, I've all, I've generally thought of it very selfishly. That's actually a very good point, Scott. I've always thought, well, I've seen this a hundred times. Don't they realize that I've seen it a hundred times? Make a movie I want to see. Me. <laughs> the problem is, is that there's not gonna, a whole lot that's going to freak us out anymore. Well, I haven't been scared in years, but I still love horror movies. I mean, there's mm-hmm. very, very few things that I get nerved every now and then. Nerve is, is the word I like to use because if, if I can feel my hair tingling on my arms that to me works that works a lot more than boo scares and stuff like that but when characters do dumb things that's i don't understand why they still do that because have real, you looked around but real people in in those situations i've been in like well i guess there are a lot of i don't know have you been in a lot yeah. of situations where demons chasing you through the forest because just like twice I mean, i'll be honest that hasn't yet happened to me but I'm just one person. I mean, honestly, in the true scenario, you what? Crap your pants and then you cry and, and as you look at your soiled underwear, right? That's pretty and much what happened. <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That, that's I mean, the fair. thing is, is that people do dumb, dumb stuff all the time in the real world. So why wouldn't they do something stupid? Yeah. I mean, have you have you seen some of these some of these videos where there these practical jokes are being played on people? Where oh it, yeah. Scare yeah. the bejesus, and 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 I watched one guy throw something out of his window and jumped out the window when some people <laughs> was scared. <laughs> it's like he grabbed like a toaster or something and just threw it out the window and then just jumped straight out of it. Absolutely true. I've seen a number of those where they'll, you know, they'll rig up an elevator so that it'll stop and the lights go out, and when those lights go out, a, a little girl crawls in looking like a ghost. They turn the light back on. People scream. They jam themselves into a corner uh, and, and just start praying to to God that this thing goes away. I've seen it where they'll put people on a subway and stop it. Lights go off. Lights come back on. Zombies are coming. They freak out. They do dumb, dumb things. That's just the nature of of humanity. Unless you go through some kind of SEAL school training <laughs> where you get your fear under control, people lose their minds. And I'm sure that if I were walking down a corridor in a, in a hotel and all of a sudden I saw a, 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 a demon or angry spirit, I would be the first one screaming and, and just running in mortal terror. That's just what people do. <laughs> I, I've seen one or a couple of those. And my first question is when these pranks happen, like I saw the one you're talking about where a creepy girl in the elevator 
And I saw one where there was a, a girl on a dock right under a light, and she just the light is shining down her. Two guys like walk up to her, and then she starts running at them, and they run away screaming because they're freaked out because she looks like um, the girl from the ring. What's her name? Mm-hmm. Whatever her name was, Samara. 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 Thank you. And and all I kept thinking was. Now, if they stop dead in their tracks and punch her in the face, is that okay? Or is yes, this- <laughs> yes. If a little girl ghost enters my elevator, if if my reaction isn't to turn around in fear, it is to lash out with a flurry of kicks and punches that would kicks. leave her yep. broken. Come on, man, go. And I wouldn't better. feel an ounce of regret because she had it coming. Well, I'm saying in the real world, like, can you get, get get arrested? Can you explain that to the cop? Like, hey, she was running at me Judge, looking like watch Samara. The, watch the tape. It's on video, <laughs> yeah. Watch the tape. Yep. I dare you to come I didn't. At me. I didn't ask for this. She just scared the bejesus out of me. My flight or fight reactions kicked in. And give and my I just shoe back. the crap out of her. I mean, I remember seeing a little internet video of a guy walking past one of those big trash bins. And all of a sudden, someone who was inside of it jumps up wearing this costume to scare the Punch person. Right walking the next to him. Yeah, he just pow punches him right in the face without even <laughs> thinking about it. That it, yeah, without a thought. That's what we do. We either flight or fight. But then, I'm more of a flyer. <laughs> Me too. But, <laughs> my first instinct would never be to punch. I don't no, think I've no, ever I'm thrown running. a real punch. <laughs> my first would be to punch and claw and yep. cut. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, yeah, yeah, yeah stun stun the crap out of them. Then I got a better chance when I haul ass. <laughs> Just don't do any of the stuff in Texas because you will get shot. Yeah, <laughs> that well. is true. Rawr, poof. Oh shit! <laughs> Halloween she, must must she's suck in dead. Texas. She's years dead. years ago, I was I was in San Francisco and and on Fisherman's Wharf. There's this there's this bridge. Going from, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just a road, you know, it's just got the a paved concrete wall. And so it's, you know, it's probably 20, 30 yards long. There's nothing from one end of this cement little bridge to the other. And there was this guy sitting there with, he was dressed and he had his face painted and stuff, but he was just sitting there with two bushy limbs on both sides of him in the middle of this walkway on, you know, on the side and people would walk by and he would just, Rawr. you know, open them up and come and get right. He's not even camouflaged. I mean, you can see a person there and he's got these brushes over him, you know, and people just, I guess, because people are so much in their own little world. And, and, and if they're tourists, they're checking out everything. And, and, you know, it's, they don't realize this bush should not be growing in the middle of this concrete <laughs> bridge as a rule, as a rule. Yeah. But it was, it was like, yeah, it was brilliant. It's that you're so much, I guess he was just so much in the, you know, in the open, that that he was actually kind of camouflaged and it was it was just hilarious to stand there and watch him scare people as they walk by. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, well let's get to our list. Let's get to our do's and don'ts. And we can go as long as you guys got them as, as long as they're entertaining, we can we can do them. Basically, we're going to go round robin until we run out of these. Everyone has a list of things that piss them off when watching a scary movie when they see characters do something. Clichés that always happen. Um, but we think, we think as viewers, we always have the right solutions and generally we're going to find out if we do, or if we're just dumb to begin with kind of works like this for every don't like, for example, don't open that closet door. Instead, you have to honor a counter or (laughs) you have to offer a counter. Do take a baseball bat and swing at the door just to be safe. And you can't just say run outside for every answer because that would just be way too easy. We assume You've ran as much as you can run for the generally. So we're gonna go Justin Bryan Scott me. Justin Bryan Scott me. So Justin, what's your first do and don't? Don't try and save stupid friends. <laughs> They're only gonna get you killed. Do let natural selection work itself out. <laughs> it's a Darwin <laughs> advice. Do not be thing. a hero for dumb people. Actually, that one well mine comes off now. All right, I had that one. <laughs> all right who's next uh, brian yeah all right don't let's split up yeah <laughs> this is dumb this is you you know there's we'll cover more ground in- this way <laughs> right right it's there's never there's any sense exactly there's there's safety in numbers here so you gotta you know do stick together so if even if somebody dies horribly you a have a chance to still get away 
And B, there's witnesses to back up your obviously unbelievable story. Yep. I see a common thread here. Selfish sons of bitches is what you are. Don't you love it, too, when you do watch a movie and someone says, hey, let's split up, and another person says, no, that's dumb. You're like, yes! Yeah, but then they still do it, which then I go back to, you're dumb. Why are you so dumb? Scotty? Uh, don't read a language that you don't understand, a written language that you don't speak or read, God especially damn. when it's written on some uh, old document or some dusty old book. Mm -hmm. Do go ahead and Google Translate that shit. <laughs> No, I like you that. You burn it. You cut the book up into pieces. You bury it. You get as far away from it. You don't open the covers <laughs> past the the fleshy <laughs> hardcover that's all sewn together. No, no, don't even open it. Just hey guys, this looks like it was made with human skin. Oh, no, let's, let's touch it. <laughs> if it don't burn, bury it. I like Scott's idea. I want to see what it translates to. Yeah, because it's, it's you're all gonna say, die, it's fine, right? That's funny. I mean, I was watching the remake of Evil Dead recently, and God, that thing works. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that blonde eye, that blonde haired, bespeckled dude opens the book, right there it says, Do not read this. Yes. Like what times. does he do? <laughs> he goes on to read it all. He's dyslexic. He deserves it to die. He's dyslexic. He has a problem. <sighs> All right, my first one. Don't stay in the house after you notice your toy clown is dancing on its own or telling your spirit is telling you to get out. Do move the hell out as fast as you can and sell the place to an unsuspecting couple for a profit. Never mention what happened. Never mention it. <laughs> Full disclosure doesn't include dirty clowns and voices in your house. Sorry. Right. You're good. Justin? <laughs> um, don't stand in the middle of the room and look around for what might be coming. Do get into a corner or get by a wall to <laughs> limit the avenues in which death can come at you. Check your corners. Check your six, <laughs> your corners. <laughs> Don't stand in the middle of the woods yelling for your friends either. Peripherals, people. Peripherals. If your friend ain't with you, consider them dead. <laughs> Get new friends. <laughs> Get new friends. There, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, there's Friendster, there's Facebook, Tinder, find new folks. <laughs> Tinder can even I think, help. I think that Justin's theme of all of his are just, just be selfish. Yeah. Just yeah. save yourself. <laughs> save yourself. <laughs> Brian? Uh, I've got a couple more, but they're more of the, I guess, maybe notes to the director. That's fine. Or I'll writer. Like just one at a time. Type though. of stuff here. All right. Um, don't it's the wind. You know, if <laughs> I've lived, I've lived in some pretty windy areas and, and, and I've heard the occasional branch rubbing against the, you know, the side of the house or the roof or something. Um, and it may raise some questions on a very rare occasion as far as, you know, what could that noise be? You know, so for the most part, if it if the problem outside is ever the wind, you're pretty much in Twister, not a not a horror movie. So <laughs> it's uh it's more like you're you know probably more like Friday the thirteenth. So blame something else. Maybe it's fireworks outside or construction, something along those lines. Whatever the case is, you know whatever. But but set it up and you know blame something else. So what is your do? Because that the was wind like gets a, a, the wind gets a bad rap. That was like a book report. Do blame something else. Okay. There we go. Do blame something else. Blame fireworks. Blame if you hear, construction. Blame. If you hear, I'm going to swallow your soul. That ain't the wind. <laughs> right. A house the doesn't sound like speaks a language. <laughs> if it speaks a language. Yeah, if it speaks any language, get out. It's so weird how the wind sounds like my Ozzy Osbourne record when I spin play it backwards. <laughs> That's so odd. Is that Latin? It's Latin wind. Weird. Yeah. If it's Latin, run. <laughs> Scotty? Must be El Nino. <laughs> More like uh, El Nunio getting out. Don't use different a, Latin. <laughs> don't no. use a firearm as a weapon. Uh, someone with a melee weapon is probably like a knife or a golf club is going to own you if you use a gun. Because <laughs> that's just it seemed like that way. Well, the people that survive are the ones that don't have the weapon you would think would would survive. Well, if you're a hundred percent sure it's loaded and cocked and the safety's not on, then no. Uh, you're, it's not going to work. All when right. does it ever work? You always get taken down by somebody with a lesser weapon if you have a firearm. So what do they an do? An axe, a bat, and a machete. You know what those three things have in common? No ammunition. <laughs> you don't run out. You don't That's run it. out. And guns? 
Uh, you, most people are bad shots as it is. Amp up your adrenaline to 11. Get that hand shaking like you got Parkinson's. You ain't hitting squat. <laughs> <laughs> Do invest in some kind of stab-proof clothing. Clothing, <laughs> because you'll be just fine. Like go to the store, right? In the, hold that thought, well, I mean, if you're, If you, you know... You got to be, pre- be prepared, right? That's what the Boy Scouts say. Absolutely. Do they make swimsuits out of Kevlar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. There they're, you not, they're not quite as sexy, but they, they do make them. It depends on what cut you get. That's true. <laughs> All right. Don't try to take on the massive killer who you just personally witnessed popping your, he- your friend's head off like a daisy. Instead, do r- run and treat the woods like an obstacle course. Get the heck out. Get out. Shoot treat butt. it like an episode of Wipeout. Just... <laughs> yeah, just- <laughs> <laughs> but don't fall as much. No, yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Justin. Uh, don't knock the bad guy down and then just run away. Double tap. R- do keep beating, stabbing, shooting, whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> keep doing that until they're tomato paste. Yeah, that's a good call. When they are down, that is when you take advantage. Oh, I like that. I yeah, like ask, that. ask the red viper. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Don't it's get not a horror movie, but <laughs> Brian, <laughs> don't monologue. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I got you. You're dead. Oh shit! <laughs> uh, don't wipe the steam off the mirror in the bathroom. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. You, you know, anytime you know, if especially if there's another face or something in the else in the mirror. Don't just keep wipe, wiping and, and turn around and, and look to see what's behind you. Just just smash the mirror and just run like hell. Get out of Just get out of there. <laughs> Mine's kind of similar, actually. Don't own a medicine cabinet. <laughs> just don't even bother just, owning it? Just a regular old shelf that you can just see without having to open a mirror or a door or anything on it. Just, just. <laughs> and shower curtains? Got to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or at least be clear. Yeah, <laughs> be clear. Be transparent. Uh, don't invite your friends to hang out at the site of a previous massacre on the anniversary of that slaughter. Yeah. Do <laughs> be smart enough to stay out of that zip code on the night of the anniversary. Some bad shit's going to go down. I think be aware just of your local area's uh, bad happenings and when those anniversaries are coming up. <laughs> because you don't want to be around. Justin, you said you're out, right? I have used up mine. Brian? Don't trip while running away. I mean, if I'm if I'm frightened enough to run, you know, I'm I'm not looking back until I'm probably crossing the county line about six or seven counties <laughs> away. Yeah, yeah I'm, don't I'm run- look over your shoulder. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not looking over my shoulder. I'm running Forrest Gump style. I'm just I'm just <laughs> running and running and running and running and just you know. And if you have to slow them down somehow, because I mean, you've got to let the uh, the inevitably just walking or you know, strolling mass murder uh, or <laughs> ghost, you know, catch up somehow. I mean, just do something different. Quicksand. Uh, Quicksand. A, a foam pit from ju- like a gymnastics building or something. Uh, I don't, a pool full of jello. I don't care. Just don't trip. That you just know, got sexy. <laughs> a pool full of jello sounds awesome. I just want me, strawberry. Let me think, of, think about it. Just like sit and think for a minute. When's the last time you were running or even walking? so clumsily that you tripped and didn't catch yourself and, and keep from falling. Uh, I got to tell you, I, I jog and I've, I've, I've hit the dirt quite frequently from roots and whatnot. I have gotten a real appreciation for horror movies o- over the last couple of years. Cause that one actually makes sense to me in the dark, in the woods, trying to run, you hit roots. You really do. Why are you running in the dark? Cause I'm being chased in the Cause dark man packing and they're trying to pack some man. <laughs> Scott, uh, when someone gives you some kind of important advice, don't ignore or forget it. Mm. Uh, do jot down a little note or put a reminder in your phone. <laughs> Just saying. Just ding. It reminds me of that new that trailer for that new horror movie, um, The Forest. Because mm-hmm. as soon as it came up and it said, stay on the path, I knew bitch is getting off this path as quickly as possible. They always do. Oh, this way is quicker. It's not marked. How is that quicker? Why are these dirt roads always faster? I don't understand. It doesn't say bypass. There's no bypass (laughs) that's the width of a bicycle. So funny. (laughs) Uh, Don't keep talking to someone in a Halloween mask that refuses to answer you. 
do punch oh, them in, punch them in the junk over and over until they hit the ground and then just keep punching them until they make a sound you realize or understand yeah you're not tony stark you can't talk to the bad guy just and have a drink a little cocktail yeah <laughs> oh it's so cute when you scare the crap out of me no it's not hit them keep hitting them bob if you see learn. a clown staring at you and you say hey what's up he didn't give you the head nod back run <laughs> <laughs> Don't walk up and try to engage him further. Brian, you have any more? No, I, I'm done. Scott? Uh, when waking up from a dream, don't assume that you're in the real world. Mm. Do, you're just in another dream. Yeah. Do watch Inception at least once a year to remind yourself of the distinct possibility that you will be waking up in another dream. That's a really... My mind is blown. That's, Ooh, a, that's a good what one. If, what if we merged Inception with... Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm. Does the top spin? Because that's really all I need. Whatever. To know. All right. <laughs> Freddy. Freddy. Until these cuts claws them. reach out and grab it at the yep. end. Hmm. Uh, I got two more. I don't know how many more do you got, Scott? Do you have any more? You You know how in a movie when you finally get that chance to kick the bad guy's ass. Mm-hmm. When that does happen, don't use the line. This is for blank, and this <laughs> is for blank. Whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about. Like the, the this is for my mom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And this yeah. is for my sister. Whatever it is, it's not necessary. Who honestly doesn't know why they're getting their ass kicked? <laughs> and it's if in the by time so- for chit chat. <laughs> yeah, and if by some strange reason they really don't know, then do leave them a note <laughs> <laughs> on their dead body. On their dead body. <laughs> All right, I got two more. Um, one, don't bring home creepy ass dolls, nor keep dolls that anyone. <laughs> Tells you has moved or talked to them. Do light those dolls on fire. Maybe sprinkle some gasoline. Get a good blaze going. Burn the shit out of them. Torch them. They're done. Yeah. Or just go Fargo and wood chipper. Oh, mm-hmm. even better. If you've got a wood chipper, there goes the doll. <laughs> if they say, I can't get it out of the house. You pick it up and you walk it out. Trick it. Whatever you got to do. I don't care. Or you move. <laughs> exactly. Move. Don't tell the doll. They're not going to know until it's, hey. Hey, why am I still in the Madison cabinet? All right, my last one. Don't ignore warnings from locals. They live there. If a few of them keep saying your new home or vacation spot is a death trap, do find better accommodations. It's important to your life. It really is. I never understand that. If I go to a new town and some guy's on the corner, it's a death curse. I start looking into the history a little bit. You know what? And then if three people say it, I, I leave. I'm done. Can't do this anymore. <laughs> Basically, if your real estate agent gives you a house that's too good to be true, it is. <laughs> oh, don't get that Amityville this. house. Keep looking. Exactly. Oh, you know what? I do have one more. Okay. Don't stare. Well, this one kind of was alluded to earlier with, with uh, Justin's don't be in the middle of a room, but don't just sit and stare at whatever impending danger is coming towards you without moving. Mm-hmm. Uh, do calculate some kind of responsible escape strategy that keeps you and those around you safe. Well, whoa, whoa. Wait, around us? Because I thought we all decided that... Well, that's you guys. You guys are all the selfish ones. They're I'm, cast I'm the still wind. looking out for my buddies. Well, it will buy you some Good. more time. You'll be the first to go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You'll be the one that I shoot in the leg. So you're, <laughs> slow, so you're slower to, to run out of there than I am. Or just kick your kneecap out. <laughs> now it's time for our listeners' thoughts. You guys got them? We posted these on Facebook. Go ahead, guys. David McGraw. Says, don't go into the bedroom or shower with the beautiful girl with the unbelievable body. Do reconsider your sexual orientation <laughs> orientation, or join the priesthood. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Amy Hutchison says, don't run up the freaking stairs or down them, for that matter, to any place that isn't ground level. Unless you have easily accessible stairs leading outside. That's a really good point. <laughs> Do invest in a Jodie Foster panic room and run straight into that shit. <laughs> Both valid points. <laughs> Both very valid, yeah. John Parrish says, for God's sakes, people, don't split up to investigate the house. Do stay in a tight phalanx formation, preferably with automatic weapons. <laughs> We're playing Left for Dead. <laughs> or 300. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. Uh, Josh Thymus says, don't fall while running. There's Brian's. Uh, because of poor shoe choice, <laughs> high heels or sandals, do wear some goddamn tennis shoes. So a did he say goddamn? He says goddamn. Yeah, goddamn tennis shoes. So a branch doesn't cost you your life. Good call. 
Good call. Yeah, high heels and horror movies do not mix. <laughs> Who goes camping in high heels? Um, girl. Well, you may not be camping, but inevitably you will end up in the woods at some point. I have seen so, girls camping in high heels. That's a true story. Hmm. I Ooh. don't understand it either. I might, I might want to go on your camping trips again. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound so bad, does it? Man packing no. sounds pretty good now all of a sudden. <laughs> anyway, Wayne Edwards says, don't sit or lay next to the zombie thinking it's dead for real. And it ain't. I just started watching The Walking Dead. I know I am way late to the party. Don't hate me, Brian. Do pick do pickaxe or arrow everybody that growls or moans as their form of conversation. That's a good rule to live by. Yeah, good good plan. Andrew Jeeves says, don't open that door where the monster's hiding. Instead, leave while you still can. Mm. Dustin Baker says, don't drink, smoke, do drugs, or have premarital sex. You will die. No exceptions. Do be a virgin. Oh, and being a woman helps too. Those virgin nerdy guys don't make it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised it took us that long to get to don't have sex. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, don't have sex, don't smoke pot, don't drink, because that's when... What that's, do that's... you do? Don't drink, don't smoke. What <laughs> do right, you Adam do? Ant. Wow. <laughs> Mark Shelton says, don't be the only black guy. <laughs> do pay attention to the creepy townie that tells you to stay away from X. The Walking Dead burns through black guys like a fat kid eats potato chips. <laughs> that He's is right true, about that. sadly. <laughs> if you're going to a party, make sure that there are more than one of you, whatever you are, at that party. <laughs> and the last one comes from Brad Peterson. He says, don't take the back roads. Stick to major highways. Thank you. Yes. Why do they do that in movies? Do you know? Because the scenery. You know, you want to take that scenic route. Is that what it is, or is they trying to get there? They they think it's going to be a shortcut, or what? Is it the scenery? Is that usually I what it is? If I was going to take those back roads, it would be for the scenery. Hmm. We did have one that came in late. It said uh, from Paula Cell, if if the bad guy, oops, person is down and you think they're dead, don't run away. Tie them up, <laughs> throw furniture on them, shoot them a few more times because they are never dead. That if you can it. draw and quarter them, <laughs> like take the time to just line them up. Well, you got to get the four horses, yes, and then you got to get the rope. But I think it's I think it's worth it. Hey, if they took the time to come back from the dead or from a, some supernatural place or something like that, yeah, I can. It's the least I can do is take the time to cut them up into four or five pieces, take them to different parts of the world, and burn each individual part. Wow, that was really least, specific. That was oddly specific. Just saying, I've thought it out. <laughs> I guess. Guess what? We're sticking with horror. And also, this idea spawned from Ken in Chicago on Twitter. So, thanks, Ken. We're just giving you a little kudos there. Who asked us, which is scarier, body horror or a psychological terror? Essentially, what terrifies you more, losing control of your body or your mind? So, we're going to talk about that because that's, that's a fascinating question in terms of what really scares you. So, how do you define psychological terror and and what are a, like a thing or a couple things not 16 things that, <laughs> that immediately come to mind <laughs> to explain that for you psychological terror is something i feel like you see them more often in thrillers that's where you have a an individual or individuals who are trying to taunt somebody and mess with their mind. They're making them feel like somebody is there and then something doesn't happen. And then they think they hear something here and then nothing happens. This is just an example. And then when they're not expecting it, that's when something happens. And it's just kind of that buildup of tension of them messing with their mind or making them think that things are happening when they're really not. That's the kind of thing that I really get drawn into. And it creates a, a great deal of tension for me because I'm like, ah, is it real? Is it really happening? Or are they just kind of imagining it? Have they have they gotten so paranoid that now we're just seeing their paranoia reflected on screen? Yeah, I I like the way you kind of describe that. I, I would actually try to be a little bit more succinct by of with it by saying that <laughs> psychological horror is that thing where uh, you don't actually see the villain. Uh, it's it, you're you're actually just spending more time with your antagonist, your 
protagonist and the uh, and seeing how whatever is affecting the protagonist really affect you know really take them down darker roads uh, i do enjoy the genre and like when i think about movies that stand out in the genre for me i think about like the first 20 minutes of when a stranger calls oh god that's so yep. good yep. you don't see anything that's terrifying yeah and and the, the more recently i think hereditary did a really good job with it too but like with the head <laughs> where'd that head go ah rolled over there uh she was asking for it you really she really does she was kind of begging for it so you really think that hereditary is very which part of that would you say is the most psychological well the part first two acts are primarily psychological yeah they don't like, really you, show a whole you, lot do they no, they really don't. Yeah. And you, you, you're, you're going on this, this road with Tony Collette that is that you think where she's she's losing her mind and she's suffering from all these, like you know, like guilt and whatever. And and she starts to see things, and the same thing happens to her son. And 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 then it was, it's not until the final, the final act, and even then, it's like the final ten minutes of the movie where it really loses its mind, and that's when the the crowd goes wild. Yeah, I was trying to, I was actually having a conversation with somebody recently and I was explaining how I felt one of my favorite movies is more of a psychological horror than it is just a horror movie. And the movie's Jaws, which obviously everybody's seen Jaws, right? And it's been talked about probably a lot this summer because it's, you know, summer movie, summer blockbuster, Jaws pops up. But if you really, really think about it, you know, psychological horror is something where it gets in your head and that's, that's the thing that scares you. And I can't think of a movie that scared me more psychologically than Jaws because it made me fearful to even get in an ocean. You know, to me, that's when I think psychological, I mean, it not only gets in the character's heads, it gets in my head. You know, it affects right. my my level of comfortability. And Jaws doesn't really show a ton of gore. There isn't really a lot of actual things that you see until, what, midway through, really? Most of it is anticipation. It's... It's what happens underneath the water. The the scene where the the guys swim into the boat and you see the the jaws of Jaws, <laughs> right? Opening up. When you see the jaws of Bruce opening up and then snatching him underwater, that is a horrifying thing to see. And it hits my brain. Even though I don't see the gore of it and I don't actually see much happening, that was psychological to me because I was terrified of water. Literally just water because of that movie. And I was ter- terrified while watching the movie because of things I don't see. You you don't even really see the shark until midway through the movie. And I was still scared like the whole time. So to me, that that really is a psychological th- uh, thriller or horror. I think of um, Silence of the Lambs is an easy one to throw out Absolutely. there because Hannibal Lecter, just his conversations are so unnerving and they get under your skin. Uh, they, they just really, really kind of ripple you in, in that respect Candyman is one tony todd just had this his voice just his voice for whatever reason the way that he spoke uh his cadence all of that was really terrifying to me in a way like the movie none of the gore stuff scared me at all bees a little bit but that's a whole other story like anything with bees <laughs> scares me psychologically but whenever his his speaking and his cadence and everything else that was just so unnerving to me very similar to hellraiser pinhead the gore never bothered me pinhead bothered me you know the visual aesthetic that got in my head so you know i I think psychological can mean more than what most people apply it to to me it's it's very much does it get in my head and scare me you know gore to me is more like i see it it makes me you know and we'll talk more about gore in a second but psychological is yes it's in the character's it's in their heads. I mean, Gone Girl is a perfect example of a psychological thriller. Like, it's very horrifying because we've all dated somebody that crazy. <laughs> so we all get it. And men and women, you know, on both sides of the coin. And so, you know, those kinds of things can get with you, but it stays with you. And that to me is also a psychological horror of sorts. Anything that stays with you. Yeah, I would I would add in Misery, Rosemary's Baby, even Hush. Oh, because those whacking, are ones- whacking the legs? Like in the feet. <laughs> when whenever they do something that it's the terror of reality in many ways and it's not about what you're i think to your point where you're not actually watching anything physically happen but you get to watch 
the reaction of your main character and the fear that they have yeah. that someone's watching them or someone is so obsessed with them and that increases their paranoia or their fear and that escalation of emotions, the audience then begins to feel. So, and, and to, I think to your other point, I think everybody defines psychological horror a little bit differently based on their own fears because sure. it's what taps into your mind. Like you said, Jaws was psychologically terrifying for you, whereas maybe something else scares somebody and it te- literally terrifies them like eight legged freaks. Maybe that's a psychological <laughs> terror for them. I don't know. I think it counts. Um, I mean, you know, there's different ways you can put it. You can think of it, I think. And if you think of like slasher movies, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Friday the 13th and any movie where kids get killed at a summer camp. Why? I don't know. I had a bad summer camp experience and it's really none of your business. We're not going to talk about that anymore. But I was happy with a lot of those dispatched victims. <laughs> but what really, the only th- the movies never scare me in terms of the gore. I always find that just funny. But whenever they're running through the woods, that's a real thing. For, like that can freak me out if it's done really right. well. Blair Witch has nothing gory in it whatsoever. And I know people, oh, Blair Witch is so tame. Shut up. If you saw it when it came out, maybe you're one of those special ones that weren't bothered. But I was scared. I was freaked out in several parts of that movie. And there's nothing gory about it. It is all psychological because it really just messes with your head. John, you saw it in the theater, right? Did you see it? I think you saw it in the theater. Oh, yeah. I definitely saw that one in the theater. And it, it was like, I ne- I've never been so afraid of a pile of sticks in my life. <laughs> Right, exactly. And the guy looking in the corner and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, he's looking at the corner. And, you know, that just seems like such a ridiculous thing, but they did such a good build up to that moment that it pays off completely. Even the marketing, it's like, those people, it really happened to those people. Uh, they're they're doing press junkets and they're talking to people. No, 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 it's real. Yeah, that part was okay. weird because you, I did have friends that said, no, no, it's real. And I'm like, I literally saw an interview with them. They're They're fine. No, man. No, man. That's just, that was before the movie. I'm like, well, I think we be doing press for a movie that ain't out yet. That's weird. But. Right. <laughs> One way or the other, they're doing press after they made it. <laughs> <laughs> One one of my um favorite scenes in film history is Reservoir Dogs, the whole torture scene. And that that is, that is gore, I would say, to, I guess, a very small degree. But none of the gore is what bothers me. It is completely just a person completely incapacitated, which is a, a personal fear. You know, the fact that you, you can't you have no control of your life, someone torturing him. And it's more about the dancing around the torture. Like, what's he going to do? What What is he going to do to that guy? What is it going to be that he's going to do to this guy? What pain is he going to inflict? That whole leading up to it is very psychological to me like that that is what freaks me out cutting the ear off that's just a cool movie thing to a cool song the actual psychological terror of it to me which did freak me out when i first watched it it was very unnerving i didn't know what he was going to do and it was really just unnerving to watch in many respects all right so let's move on to the the gore or bodily injury horror i guess you can look at it either way but it's really gore because you're you know body parts are hurting cuts slash fingernails being pulled out oh i was gonna say fingernails are my yeah john where are you at with gore body injury horror oh my god i i psychological has its merits gore also has its merits depending on how it's done sure at this point in in cinema it's one of those things where you can tell the bad and you can tell the good and sometimes they're both good and sometimes they're both bad you know what i mean yeah if you have tons of entrails that's never scary to me Right. Lots of intestines just laying around. Blah, I'm just holding guys looking very dramatic as he's holding his guts. I'm like, he would be dead. This is silly. This is just dumb. But take out somebody's eye and I'm like, no, <laughs> not the eye. God damn it. Pluck it out with you chopsticks. Know, oh, there is just like there is so many movies that I can think of that just do it terribly. But again, it's one of those things that you either get it really like hostile is one that I can think of that got it done right. And uh, even the sequel where it's like, they can't possibly do this any worse. They did. And it's fine. Or, you know, uh, the human centipede is another one where it's like, you can't, (laughs) (laughs) you 
you can't make this worse. And they found a way to make it both a bad movie afterwards. Like the, the two sequels are both bad and worse at the same time as far as scarier. What uh, really interests me about this conversation and where it took a turn is that you've seen both the sequels to The Human Centipede, but you haven't seen The Greatest Showman. <laughs> so you, oh, yeah. I still haven't seen that yet. You you took time out of your day to watch a guy put his so a mouth onto an ass. Yeah. So, spoiler alert, that's what Human Centipede's about. Think about it. But you didn't take the time to watch Rebecca Ferguson dazzle you with a song or uh, Hugh Jackman do a little dance. That's where you are in your cinema achievements. See, I was very afraid that watching The Greatest Showman would, would, would make me like a little bit happy and I can't afford to feel that way right now. Well, so. now, it makes, now it makes sense. It's all human centipede. So keep watching those sequels and if they keep cranking them out, you'll just watch them all. Right. Because at least I'm, it's like par for the course for me. <laughs> so disturbing you are. Amanda, where are you on gore? I like gore. I I have no qualms with seeing it on screen. There are some things like fingernails that get under my skin more than others. Uh. <laughs> but it's not something that scares me. And I feel like that's where my defining line is on, in this question, is if we're talking about what's scary, gore is not scary to me. You know, sometimes it can make you go, ooh, and ah, and ugh. But it's not something that terrifies me. It's not something that makes me shiver or anything. It's the psychological horror that messes with me. Gore is something that I think is, for whatever reason, it is enjoyable to watch on screen for horror fans. Isn't that weird? It's it is weird, very right? weird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that says about us as people, but a lot of the people that I know that are you know, really big horror fans are also some of the sweetest people I know and the kindest people. So, yeah, you know, there's like serial killers would be. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. <laughs> and introverts. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Fantasy is being played out on screen. That's it's so you just... don't do it. <laughs> that's <laughs> exactly. So you, uh, that's Jenny from The Office. That's what that. Ah, uh, it's out of my system. I don't have to think about it anymore. Yay. I've got to <laughs> listen to some true crime so I at least know how to do it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> But it's one of those things where if people who don't like horror movies, they I feel like they get more creeped out by the gore for whatever reason. You know, if they're not really somebody who watches it, they can handle the psychological portion of it better than they can handle the gore. And I don't know why that is scarier to them. I don't know why why gore in general is scary at all. It could be because I grew up with a very clear understanding. You know, I was taught and shown the behind the scenes of scary movies and how it's all not real. So maybe in the back of my mind, I just recognize this isn't real. (laughs) But I guess that's my question back to you guys is what makes it scary for people? Why is it is, you know, seeing a, a slasher flick like Friday the 13th, why does that scare someone? It's it's the you're not in control of the situation, I think is a part of it. I think I think very much a part of it is this is a situation where I live my life and I'm in control of everything I do, but here's a situation where a madman is going to kill me and he's going to cut off a part of my person and I can't do anything about it. So there's that fear. Like if you go back to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, very there's a lot of gore in there. A lot of it's implied, but there's still a lot of gore in it. And that is one where it terrified me because it was so realistic. It was so visceral. And it really felt like I'm not going to escape this, you know, in, in your mind. And the horror, every time you saw somebody get killed, it really felt like, oh, my God, this could happen to me. And then you're walking around and you're like, mm-hmm. so just the idea of a killer on the loose and you have no control over the situation and then seeing what they do to the people that they're attacking, I think that that sits with a lot of people. I mean, I've had there's definitely horror movies that have worked that magic with me in terms of um, the terror of it all. Well, yeah, jumping on the the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, some of those kills were just like pure brutality. And the thing that really gets you about that is that it's not some sort of like uh, demon killer or like ghost monster thing. It's those are those are real people. Those are real people that you will find in the middle of nowhere. You know, on a, on on 
you know, I, I drive down these streets in North Carolina lately and I'm like, Hey, uh, that's a Texas chainsaw <laughs> massacre house. Look <laughs> yeah. at everything that's in the front, exactly. front yard. There's, there's like 15 cars. I, I can't imagine that house needs 15 cars of all those different, th- th- those different years. And, and then the way some of those, those deaths happen, like I, I, when I, especially in the remake, I don't know why it hit me harder in the remake than in the original, but that first kill where he, you know, uh, Leatherface s- slides that door open, brains a dude, and he's just on the ground and his whole body is com- convulsing from the, the oh, head trauma. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, like, that's, ex- I, I imagine that's exactly what it would be like with that much head trauma from a freaking sledgehammer. It wouldn't be like, uh, boom! Your body's still. You can. You know, there's. There's got to be something going firing in in what's left of his brain to be doing all that, and it's got to be excruciating. And it's just. Ugh. Yeah, there. There's a movie I have love. I love, and I, I've. I think I've mentioned it once or twice before, but not often because it it makes me embarrassed to admit it. But it's a movie called Relentless. It stars Judd Nelson, where he's a serial killer. And whenever he kills somebody, and yes, I said Judd Nelson, goddammit, and he's very good in that one particular role. But the the way that he kills people is that he basically uh, finds them wherever they are. He puts the weapon in their hand and then he makes them do it to themselves. And so you basically watch the knife go in. You watch them choke themselves. You know, you it's it's very visceral in that way. And for whatever reason, that one always kind of got me. I just that was terrifying to me because you're watching a killer inflict pain to your own person without your control. It's a lot of it to me is like the lack of self-control and the damage that the weapons are and the person are doing to your body. And that, that's just one example where it really got to me. And that wasn't so much psychological because the knife is going in the woman's chest. And I'm like, Oh my God, if they, if somebody came up behind me, they could make me do that. Oh my God, that's terrifying. You know, I mean, it just gets in your head. I think it is. There is an element of psychological horror though, because it's somebody who's, removing your your ability to choose your ability to actually decide what's going to happen and they've taken that control from you in a much different way than if they were to just come up to you and stab you because you're sitting there in that individual's shoes as a viewer you're sitting in that person's shoes the innocent person and you're having to watch them make that choice and so you can feel that terror that they must be thinking and feeling and how much fear they must have and what they have to go through to get to the point where they do what this killer is asking of you killer by association or whatever (laughs) yeah and to to jump off that another part of it another piece of it kind of connecting the tissue on that is that we're all very familiar with our own bodies, right? Like a lot of movies or television, when you're watching them, it's all fantasy. You know, you're not a a really cool cop. You're not a really great doctor. You're not a really cool lawyer. But whenever you see pain inflicted on a person pulling a fingernail, we've all done that or we've almost done it or we thought about doing it and, and you know what it would feel like. You know, somebody stubs a toe in a movie that that can really create a visceral reaction because we all know exactly what that feels like. You know, a lot of it is we have fingers and toes and eyeballs and ears and noses and hearts. hearts. Yeah. Everything else that can. And we know that that would hurt. That would really hurt. So if we see it on screen, oftentimes it can correlate in our brain and be like, if that would really hurt if that was me, it really hurt to lose an eyeball. I think that would be very painful. So I can envision the loss of that eye. Or, you know, if you get like a lead pipe shoved up your bum hole because it's a revenge film, you can think, ouch, this probably wouldn't feel good. (laughs) Depends on your perspective. What you do on your time is your business. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, because there's a lot of things that I think when you think bodily injury and gore, like a lot of gore. Subtle gore gets me way more than anything. Like I was talking about entrails where somebody's just holding their guts. That never does anything. I'm just like, it's so ridiculous. You know, if you've got, you're watching Friday the 13th and you get a, a crazy kill, that's more just fun to watch than it is. And for whatever reason, don't judge me. It's just more fun to watch than anything else. But then there are other ones where it's just very, I don't know, it just gets under your skin. I don't know. You watch Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th part two is the only one that really, really gets under my skin. 
and it's just more because of how it's shot. But a lot of the kills are more intense, I think, because of just a lot of the kills just feel more personal in nature. So when there is something gory, it feels like that could be me. I could be in that situation. There's one where he kills a, a guy in a wheelchair. It's really kind of a sad scene. And the same token, the gore really impacted the whole the whole shot. You know, a lot of that, a lot of times that can really impact a shot if you do it right. If you overdo it, it makes the movie look cheesy. Sleepaway camp. <laughs> 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 Just saying. All right. So we covered psychological, we covered gore. So that's the question. What's, what's scarier for you? I think we kind of talked about it a little bit, but you got to pick one. What scares you more and why? For me, for sure, psychological. The gory horror is more just like a, usually I think you put it nicely where it's fun. <laughs> you like hoorah, the crazier, the gore, the kill. You're just like, whoa, that's creative and that's crazy and that's fun. Yeah. Miles Teller should be in more horror movies. <laughs> yeah. Psychological actually scares me. And that's where my that's where my line is. Gore does not scare me. A psychological actually affects me. And so, you know, it's it's got to be the winner. I'm going to have to agree that psychological will scare me more. However, gore is a lot more fun to see in the theater. OK, well, yeah. that makes sense. But which which is scarier, though? Like you're saying, psychological. Which is scary or psychological, of course. So you, you mentioned you mentioned Gone Girl, and I remember after I saw Gone Girl, I didn't sleep well for like a month and a half, two months, because I was like, I, I was having flashbacks. Who am I like living that, so. with? <laughs> yeah. It's more like so, you start fl- I, reflecting on your past, right? And you're like, oh, they could come back. <laughs> yeah. They could yeah. always come back. I'm telling you. I thought that movie was a documentary for a while. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. I'm just like, are we sure? Are we sure this is fiction? Ben Affleck might be in a documentary. I don't know. <laughs> uh, same way. I mean, it's it usually psychological will get me more. Uh, but on the same token, man, I don't I don't get. Here's what I would say. I think when I was younger, up until probably like my mid twenties, psychological really got me way more than anything else. But as I've gotten older, anything that's a real painful death or infliction of pain you you pull a fingernail off of anybody i can't look at it i legitimately can't look at it i can't watch a bee sting like when somebody gets stung a lot with bees because i'm phobic of bees so i mean there, there are certain things that are terrifying to me and fingernails getting pulled off or toenails getting pulled off is by far the worst thing i can watch like that scares me more than anything hannibal lecter could ever say because i can i can walk away from words I can't walk away from somebody pulling my fingernails off. Well, you could, but it would hurt even more. <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of adding to the problem, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> to, to help to help with that, like we're of a certain age when you trip over a branch, that's going to affect you for a while. Yeah. And you're all you're thinking about is like, wow, that 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 bodily injury that's happening to that poor person is going to be the rest of their life. They're going to be feeling that. <laughs> I've been that poor person. And, yeah. I get it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Can I add <laughs> in an, an additional thing. category of fear, which is probably my most significant fear factor? No. That's how you would well, do it. We get an extra episode out of that. We milk it. But you can, you can mention it, but you're not going to I'll mention it. it. Okay. Supernatural, especially as I've gotten older, things with ghosts oh, or, God. you know, creepy things like that. For whatever reason, they legitimately terrify me it is so hard for me to sit through something when it's supernaturally and it's weird because i'm not i'm i'm very agnostic it's not like i you know pray to a higher power or you know genuinely believe in ghosts i think the possibility is for anything exist but you would think that i would have that deep fear if i like truly like believed in it and that satan was sending ghosts back to earth to terrorize people as demons but that's not where i'm at it's just like for whatever reason man if i see a ghost (laughs) and they creep up behind somebody i might pee my pants see i am so not scared of anything (laughs) ghost related for whatever reason the conjuring got me uh a couple times so i mean there's some good jump scares and stuff like that but 
my God, I don't believe in ghosts, so I have I just don't get scared in ghost movies. And if I had a ghost, I'd probably just walk around naked just to make him leave. I mean, there's just, there's nothing really about ghosts that do anything for me. Nothing. So, I, But that would maybe fall under psychological, because I think you got to be crazy to believe in ghosts. Ha! <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It, you don't have to be crazy. But I just, I just don't. I don't. So psychological seems like uh, the win, although I do think I'm probably more affected by gore nowadays just because of the, the fingernails thing. It's really a problem. If I see it, man, it really ruins my day. <laughs> I will actually I cut it, my fingernails. After that. I always cut my fingernails. Like after I see a scene like that, I will go cut them because I'm just like, eh, nah, no, that's going to have to go. I, I don't want it ripped off on accident. There's only so many times you can watch America's Funniest Home Video to see some poor dad get hit in the nards for you to be like, okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> exactly. This is not funny anymore because I know it's me. Right. I've got a couple listener comments I want to read and just to kind of ex- expand the argument, I guess. Uh, Christina Flores said, gore scares me far more than psychological. So gore wins for her, especially when it's based on a true story. The very thought that there are people out there that could brutally torture, mangle, and savagely kill someone terrifies me. And that kind of goes back to my point. In this day and age, I think gore might be more affecting when when done really well, just because there are so many more people that will do that sort of thing these days. It just feels like, you know, not to go back to our age again, but when John and I were kids, there weren't a ton of, I mean, there were a few serial killers now and again that popped up, but you didn't hear about murder all the time. Now, that's the obsession with most of the world is true crime, mm-hmm. documentaries, podcasts, whatever. We're, we're listening to murder while we're eating our breakfast cereal. Yeah. Man, yeah. I watch Criminal Minds while I'm eating my lunch. I pu- put up my Netflix in my office, shut the door, and I just watch that terror come across my screen. <laughs> and then I wonder why I have a hard time sleeping and wondering if I'm hearing a noise or if it's just the dryer. Somebody in my house. Or is it just the dryer? Maybe it's somebody in your house doing laundry. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> That's a weird invitation, but you're going to regret if it. If you want to do my laundry. I didn't say you... your laundry. I said doing oh. laundry. Like okay. they're walking around, they got a sack of laundry and they're like, oh, there's a there's a nice place to <laughs> do my clothes. So weird. <laughs> At 3 a.m. That's fine. It's like a laundry mat that I break into. Um. Jess Dimas says, psychological for sure for the long lasting impact, but I would say bodily injury and gore has a more immediate impact. It gets that split second visceral reaction from the audience where psychological horror is a slower burn and really takes its time burrowing into your mind and haunting you long after the credits roll. It's like a really hot pepper. The initial burn is the gore, but that later payoff for the plumbing is all psychological. Good point. That's a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'm all for pepper analogies. we could have just canceled this entire podcast and just read that comment and we don't, wouldn't have had so much discussion don't think it was quite that good but you know we'll give them whatever credit you'd like all right i just meant it was succinct <laughs> compared to me yes that is a that is a fact i think uh john <laughs> has amanda gotten any more succinct since you've been gone absolutely not <laughs> okay okay you know Rude. next week troy heinrichs <laughs> is coming back and then there's going to be for the first time in a long time four four hosts we're gonna have to, we're just gonna have to get a button is what we're gonna have to do man we're gonna, we're gonna have to institute a button and we'll just have to cut you off troy is worse than i am thank you very much he is not i yes am- but troy is interesting <laughs> <laughs> i want to cast my vote to kick john off the island <laughs> <laughs> wow. That one, I felt it in here, in my heart. It hurt. Oh, you don't have a heart there. Oh, it's funny. All right, well, remember, the next time you head to a theater, buy popcorn, because we're out. And probably going to go get some medical attention for that sick burn on Amanda. <laughs> Yeah, somebody call the ambulance because I'm hurt. <laughs> 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 <laughs>